appreciate uh, the invite by Mazda and wish you great luck, Kevin, on your future endeavors. And I agree with the Magna get together and uh, this seems to be a little bit more of a science-y inf information type of event anyway, so I, I enjoy it and I enjoy the whole conversations myself. Uh, any event, um, the name of this presentation is Proper Planning for an Industrial Reef uh, in One's Home. Uh, how many, just I see there's a lot of people here. It's, it's actually, uh, there's gonna be a lot of big tanks around soon, right? You guys are building them all? How many are here for uh, just learning about some principles that you can apply to yourselves, or how many are you actually building some 10, 20,000 gallon tank? Raise your hand if you're in the latter. Okay, so we're all in the former, and uh, we geared the presentation a little bit towards that, and um, my opinion, we took out, we took the things that we thought were the uh, jaw droppers, the things like, oh my God, I didn't realize that, um, and we try to put it together in one presentation. And, and so help you guys on a 20 gallon if you need. So let me start with the presentation. This is the agenda today. Um, I guess we'll just be going through the first things about Polar Reef and the team, and then we'll, we'll get into the, the meat of the, of the uh, equipment. And, and the re I guess the key word I'd like to highlight tonight, today would be redundancy. Um, it will keep coming up and, and you'll see the, the effort here um, to really build a super system that didn't need much care at all. So what is Polar Reef? Um, Polar Reef's a little complicated. It was an organization that I had uh, legally set up. Um, COVID hit and people were home, quarantined, uh, and, and I didn't have a bad view in that quarantine. So I wanted to share that view and make some videos and make people happy and smile and uh, started to become a DJ of 70s and 80s music. When I look back at those videos, I'm almost embarrassed of what they look like. We've gotten quite a bit uh, better at this. Um, the key here, uh, what is Polar Reef now? Well, the main goal for the time being is to educate, to inspire, and to bring about smiles. And we will be focusing on that part first. Um, doing presentations like this, we will be uh, doing presentations at colleges, we will be doing presentations and supporting marine science organizations, um, as well as schools. So we have to get those kids uh, in young. So we'll be doing working with uh, states like Connecticut, Florida, and other marine science states and, and, and uh, donating time, money, et cetera, to help marine science. We need to get those, that spark back in the kids to make sure this hobby survives. This is a better job than I can do uh, explaining the mission. I actually did it. It's about three years old, this video. We've been saving it for the launch of our website. Rashid, you wanna, this sort of explains the, the mission. Hi, I'm, I'm Andrew Sandler. I am, uh, I guess, considered a passionate, extreme hobbyist of all sorts. This is my glorious hobby where I can relax and escape the hustle and bustle of Wall Street. Uh, when things aren't going so smoothly in the market, I look up and it gives me a sense of how small we are in the universe. Two thirds of our planet in blue. Certainly that there's life beyond stock prices. <laughs> I think what this is, is living art. I think you are reproducing a snapshot of nature. And doing that in an extreme fashion. There's a whole nother side that, you know, is investment and about, about uh, owning houses or traveling. And, and so that's not my thing. My thing is this. I guess I have a, uh, a little impulsive perfectionist personality where, you know, 10 gallons became 20 gallons and 
20 became 40, 40s became a couple of hundreds, and fresh became salt. And here we are, I'm 54 years old, and, and, and this is what's the creation of all that. 17,000 gallons. The, the original vision for this tank was pretty close to this. Um, we knew we wanted something, a wall of water of somehow. The idea was to do something wonderful and build a bulletproof system that would run run itself um, as maintenance free as possible, if if there is such a thing. And uh, this system took uh, nearly six years, from from planning engineering stage until fish first fish hit. Six years, very painful, very frustrating period of time. The grand design was um, to, to display some of the most unusual, rarest, and most beautiful fish from the Indo-Pacific. Uh, those, those fish basically ranged in biotope type from uh, basically Hawaii through Indo-Pacific and the Red Sea. Anytime a stunning new rare fish, uh, whether it's a new species, or it's just an unusual species that you can't ever get. Once a diver gets it and it goes to a wholesaler, um, that wholesaler or diver usually contacts me as the go-to guy. So I get the calls, I get to see the unusuals, and this one fish that you're talking about, this, this tang, was caught in the Maldives. They call them tangs. It's basically a, a Desjardini sailfin tang. When I saw it, um, I, I didn't know what it was. It's a one of a kind freak of nature. And I like things that are rare and, and collecting things that are rare. And this particular species had never been seen before or at least genetic abnormality in that particular fish. They asked me how much I'd pay for it. I try to play it off like it's not such a big deal. <laughs> and, you know, they offer one price and then I wait a few days and call them back and say, I'll take it for X. And I bought it. And I brought them home and put them through a normal quarantine. And somehow he got sick again with a blood infection and I posted the, we got a problem here. And all of a sudden it became everybody's, in the, everybody's favorite fish in the hobby. And everybody started rooting for this, this tang. And how's he doing? And so not only did he come in famous, but after he came through this whole process, he really became famous and well marketed. So now everybody asks about him. Uh, everybody knows about this fish. Uh, he, he's a famous fish. Maybe he'll pay me royalties one day. <laughs> Personally, I don't have a guilty conscience because I know when I get the fish, they're basically coming to Disney World. Okay? So I'm going to take care of them. And they probably have a higher lifespan in my tanks than in nature. Me building this tank, I can inspire this hobby to take it to the next level and raise the bar and therefore save more fish in the future. Uh, over the years, I've become significantly uh, philanthropic and, and now I'm, I'm on a mission to give back, to give back to the hobby, to give back any way I can. And, and now um, is my time to give back to the hobby, whether this is to grow the hobby and a learning experience or raising the bar or inspiring people. That's what I want to do. At the very least, put a smile on our face. I want people to 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 uh, to smile, to be to be happy, to to bring joy, to peace, um, and help them follow their dreams. If their dreams is owning a fishbowl, I'm happy for them. If they want to massive scale tank, that's fine. If, if they get into cars and become an expert, and that's great too. Could have easily have 
invested the money more wisely than this. I could have probably had beach houses and other things staring at the ocean instead of this. But um, following the passion and living life like that and, and inspiring, yeah, that's a whole different story. Uh, that's every time I watch that. That's uh, gives a little neat goosebumps. Um, in any event, uh, may, maybe one day the the, uh, the tank will get some revenue and we can write off our expenses too. That wouldn't be a bad goal. In any event, uh, here here is our team uh, currently. Um, we can go through them one one at a time. So. Uh, that's myself and my wife. My wife, uh, she gets a lot of questions, by the way, on, on how did you, uh, how did you convince the, uh, the spouse to, to do this? And uh, the, the joke I at least tell is, it's a second marriage. <laughs> yeah, don't take that too literally. It's still, you still need an understanding wife. Um, Rashid, we brought on recently to run operations and, and, and head coral care, and he's running the whole organization and uh, is the one that set this whole map and thing up. Uh, Yeltsin has been with me now for, uh, since 2000. He was my driver, and uh, he's now running the, the reef day to day. Um, and he's been with me, again, running reefs. Uh, trained him probably the last reef tank in 2013. Jonathan and Michelle, uh, they're actually in the audience here. Jonathan um, is the mastermind behind the, techn the technical wizard of this tank. Um, I try not to let that secret get out too much because I don't want him working on anything else. I like him around close. Uh, Michelle, they run the store in Long Island called Country Critters. It's an incredible place. Uh, Michelle does diving for me. Uh, uh, basically uh, has an unbelievable artistic uh, approach and, and uh, really good corals also. And we recently brought on Dunn, who's basically just in charge of coral care now. So I thought we would start with um, specs of the tank, just, just a little bit of introduction. Materials, some utility service, heating, cooling, permits, and foundation. And, and again, I, I try to focus on the the parts here that I thought were, were, were most jaw-dropping and uh, holy cow, I didn't think of that. There's some pictures here. You can see the tank, how, how it first came in with three sides of actually delivered this way, three sides bonded acrylic. It was brought in with a crane. Uh, this is the huge slab that was built. Um, but the timeline is basically the house was bought in 2013. Uh, we didn't move in for a few years, and even after we moved in, the house was still a construction zone in the basement. Um, the first fish was November 2019, and that was a stressful period because I had a, uh, I had a uh, high school reunion that was hosted at my house, and the party planners made me fill the tank with fish for the party and the quarantine system wasn't all ready yet and sure enough, what happens after 30 days, voila, we get some fish disease. Uh, fortunately, we knew that there was a possibility and planned for that. It was basically four inch acrylic Reynolds uh, material. I told you it was shipped all three bonding sides and th these are basically the sizes and so forth. The back and the floor are fiberglass, honeycomb fiberglass. You don't think about closing bridges, lanes, and, and highways when, when you order this stuff. But um, so, some of the things that we ran into uh, was just that, and, and crazy permits needed, including bridges, lanes. Uh, and this one also, we, we had to figure out a way of, of draining or doing water changes for 5,000 gallons at a time which really means 20 to 25,000 gallons of wastewater with RO. So we needed permits to bury a bunch of cesspools, uh, local uh, town village stuff, soil samples, et cetera, et cetera. Same thing with the foundation. We had to take soil samples. 
um, to make sure this thing wasn't going to sink. And the engineer basically came out with a plan. It's a cement and rebar uh, platform that extends about eight feet in, is it eight or five? I, I, I always forget. Five is five to eight. Uh, in addition to the general dimensions of the tank to offload the weight. Um, plumbing, all sorts of plumbing, uh, schedule 40 on the, on the light stuff, but mostly 80 on the pressure stuff. And I guess the uh, thing I wanted to highlight was this special PVC that we used um, that could handle the heat for the boilers, which we will, we will show in a second. Th this might be uh, the most shocking slide that, that, that out there. Uh, this is a utility bill. And just in case, you might, we might want to look at that first and then explain it. Um, it's actually built on, we have two meters. One is the house, and that's an 800 amp service. And the fish tank needed another 800 amp service itself. So we have 1600 amps in the house. Uh, we were asked whether we wanted to bring in phase three power or stay with phase one. That's a whole other discussion that I'd rather not get into, but it was a very big investment and we couldn't get it at the time. Uh, had, have I, making the decision right now fresh, I would do a phase three build, not a phase one build, and spend the money on, on getting it. But this is a utility bill and uh, this is billed every uh, 60 days, so don't, get, don't have a heart attack. The, but this is just the fish tank. This is just the fish tank. And the fish tank runs about $10,000 a month in electric. And that's at 11 cents of kilowatt hour. And that is not all the tanks in the house. We still have a major 2,500 gallon, so we think that number is going to be going up. Uh, well, where do you start, basically? Uh, when, you, when you bring in all these amps, you have to control the power. And we, we went through a phase uh, one decision. So we had to get what, what are called VFDs. For all of you that don't know what a VFD is, these are uh, devices that basically regulate the, uh, the voltage, monitor the voltage, and allow me to control the speeds of the pump individually. Uh, some of you will see things like 15,000 gallon tank in the slide. Some of it will say 17,000. And the truth of the matter is, it really depends on what speed we run the pump set. So it's hard to imagine, but every inch up on the glass is just about 1,000 gallons. So we can run the speed of this thing at 17 and up to the bar, we can lower it uh, to 14 and so forth. Um, the VFDs protecting um, the computer. Um, <laughs> I have something here to remind me that um, not only do we have to service this computer all the time, but we have to maintain spare parts and spare inventory, because things happen. And just the other day, uh, we had a lightning strike in the house. Uh, it started in uh, late, late August, and the ground um, had about 10 to 20 volts in it, and people were getting shocked and all sorts of things. And believe it or not, the lightning took out the brain of the computer, and we had to replace the brain, and we just happened to have an extra brain. Um, that will be a, uh, a chub item but uh, along with the other damage. But the point is spare parts. And I don't mean just on the computer. I mean on everything. We have a spare on every pump, on every part. Um, can't take a chance at, at, this, at this scale. What else is here are the build specs? Um, heating. The heating is done via heat exchanger where there are coils in that heat exchanger, and all the condensers and heat-producing uh, materials are outside. And um, we went through a heating decision 
Yeah, there's some of the pictures right here. Here are the two boilers that heat the tank. Uh, it's about 1.3 million BTU. Now, why did we go with such a huge situation? We didn't need it, really. Uh, what we did was um, we, we had a sub-basement in New York that gets cold in the winter, 45, 50 degrees. And we had a decision whether we wanted to heat the water and warm the room up that way or put an HVAC system in the sub-basement. And what we decided was heating the water. And we heated the water for another important reason in that we wanted to be, to be able to, just in case of emergency or regular water changes, I, I don't know whether you see the vat here. Is there a picture of the vat here somewhere? Oh, yeah, there it is, top right. That's it's a dark picture. You can see the scale of it. That was the night Jonathan brought the thing over. Um, it's 5,000 gallon vat. Uh, and we have two more vats of 2,500 each. So we got 10,000 gallons of holding capacity in the house. And we want to be able to heat our water up fast. So these boilers allow us to do 5,000 gallons from 60 to 80, 30 minutes, 30 minutes or less. Uh, these are the outside condensers and so forth. Those are the two meters. Chilling, same thing. We wanted all the heat producing equipment outside. We went with train industrial uh, condensers with the heat exchanger. Some of the other points I sort of wanted to make here is the redundancy. And, 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 and this is really important. I'm, I want to go back to the heat also on the redundancy. We split these things up. We split them up just in case. So two chillers are on the closed loop, and two chillers are on the main pump. And the reason we do that is just, God forbid, we got to turn the main pump off. There's a leak. We have to drain the tank down halfway down. The tank is able to survive with just the sand filter and the chillers on the closed loop. Uh, having four five-ton units also separates the risk. These things need freon and servicing. One goes down. We just turn the other one on. It actually does it automatically. Um, so they're split. There's four of these things, and they are split up in the system. So. Uh, we can run two, three, and there's extra spares around all the time. <laughs> Here's an interesting topic. I get a, I get a lot of questions on, and, and, and w you, you don't need to know that humidity kills a house. Uh, our evaporation just from this tank is running roughly 50 gallons a day. Um, and there's going to be other systems in that house. So we had to spec out a system that would remove 100 gallons a day plus of, uh, of humidity. And we have these Dectron systems, and they're located strategically in the, in the rooms that we want. Um, and these are the outside condensers. There's four, four of these units. This is the one that's not working so good right now. <laughs> But um, uh, they're located and uh, vents are, are, are created in different rooms and these need to be serviced also. And, and I would just say that I was blown away by the hidden cost of, I would say, this item and the computer. Those are the two sort of massive hidden costs. Uh, and when I say computer, it wasn't just the code. It was also, and I'll get to it, it was also the probes, et cetera, et cetera. All right, this is the computer. This is, uh, this is Skynet. <laughs> and um, the best way for me to, to, to explain it to you is really just walk you through a little bit of the flow diagram and, and then talk to you about what else this thing does and what it monitors. But you can see here uh, on, on the main, there's three engines. Two are being used. One's a spare. They all go through the UV. Uh, then there's this closed loop right here. Closed loop has an extra spare pump on it. Uh, it goes through the sand filter, and it's got a separate chilling system like we talked about. 
Uh, there's the sump and the level. We can talk about all, all those controllers. We will. And these are all the reactors and skimmers uh, that are run on the loop. So more or less, I don't know, 60% of the water um, is flowing through the main system. And, 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 and the balance of the, uh, of the water is, is basically going on these loops with the skimmers and the closed loop. Now this closed loop uh, has got this big sand filter. We're going to get into that when we get into mechanical filtration. So let me just focus on the computer now. So what does this computer do? It's got all sorts of modules. You can see here, um, this, is the, this is the closed loop and the sand filter. This is the surge valves. Uh, these are the skimmers. This computer has more code than a typical water industrial plant by three times. The reason why we know that is because we hired an industrial water plant guy to build it. And this is what he tells me. I keep asking him how much code is in here. He won't even tell me. But it took years. And, and it's not the kind of thing you can do remotely. He's got to come to your house and stare and, and debug and, and do the lights and make sure everything works. So it's a lot of sitting time. Uh, also, it's got a ton of probes, and, and, and um, this is a basically a, a PLC. I don't know if you guys know what a PLC is. It's actually the name of the, of the unit is actually Productivity 2000. That's what we're using. And uh, there are two other remote locations, and they talk to each other. And they're measuring all sorts of things um, on the computer. And, and, and this is big. And off the computer, we have several controls uh, and shutdown mechanisms just in case Skynet goes crazy, um, particularly in the UV and the ozone uh, area where, where there's danger. So we're running uh, most of the probes are these GF Signet probes. And I just want to show you how many different probes are in the system. 20 for temperature, 15 for, for uh, flow. Yeah, there's done different flow sensors. Um, a high-low water level sensor, radar on the sump so we can mon monitor sump. The worst text and alarm you can get is low sump level. <laughs> That's bad. Uh, this thing actually was programmed so that it sends alarms um, and texts. And if you don't answer or set it, it actually makes a phone call uh, to the house and wakes you up because it assumes you're asleep. So there's a cellular thing on it. Um, these things are constantly monitoring voltages. Uh, and the, we, we actually got the generators on the computer. So it actually monitors the health of the generators, which is pretty important. Um, and the generators go through its weekly test. It's monitoring the LED ballast, the UV bulb temperatures inside, outside. Uh, it's got shutdown mechanisms. It changes the water valves. Every valve in the tank, uh, it opens and closes it, uh, and so forth. Obviously, it man uh, pH, ORP, salinity, and, and in several different spots in the tank. Um, particularly, I like to measure the uh, the ORP in different spots. And you'll, you'll see a picture here how, how nuts I am about that. All right, here's another uh, part of the system that we built that, that I, I wanted to give a little bit of color. Again, this is not about, uh, this is not about meds. I don't want to get into how I medicate fish or anything like that. But you got a space plan to have a quarantine system. And to me, this place, these are some of the fish that have gone through the quarantine systems. These are the corals in the quarantine. Uh, this is actually uh, the system at 100% capacity, uh, some of this eye candy. All these fish went through the same protocol. Um, we actually changed the protocol around for the species. We do different things with amphias and wrasses. And my point is to plan this out. This is a space, a space hog. And you need to figure out uh, pretty much whether you want to convert this space uh, so that you have 100% occupancy when you're filling the tank up and have the ability 
to have that 100%, or if you want to build to 50, you're going to need to buy quarantine fish, etc., cetera, um, or, or do it slower. We chose to do it and overbuild it, like the whole system. Uh, these were actually uh, five 500 gallon systems, basically. Custom acrylic made by Titan. Uh, two of the systems are combined for 1,000 gallons. And one of the systems was actually used uh, with no meds, just as a holding system. And let's watch. And that's the system we converted to coral. And you'll see that system right here. Um, right here. This was actually a fish system. And it's now housing uh, most of our uh, inverts. I guess we do urchins and crabs and snails in there um, and, and some LPS. That's, that's the system before it went in. And uh, the other point I'd like to make here really is um, uh, you go through waves. Obviously, fish come in, fish come out. You, a species gets available. Oh, my God, I have to have it. And then there are certain, certain times there's nothing going on in quarantine. Um, and we've had to convert quite a bit of the space now from fish care to coral care. So, so these are now... 425 gallon baffles holding coral, uh, quarantining coral, along with this 300, 400 gallon system. Uh, and we still don't have enough. We're still going to be adding grow out tanks uh, because once the coral's quarantined, we want to watch them and uh, we would rather watch them in, in glass and through the system than, than in these bins. Here's the filtration systems. Let's just go, go through it quickly. Uh, my mechanical is a sand filter that holds, I don't know, thousands of gallons. There's the size of it. It's big. It's an industrial size sand filter. It's actually not filled with sand. It's filled with inert glass beads. And uh, we're able to backwash that um, very easily. It doesn't hold dirt. It comes out really nice, There's not a lot of slog of bacteria in that. Uh, we backwash the sand filter. If it's not weekly, it's once every 10 days, and we do it to keep the PSI down uh, in, the, in the pressure on the sand filter and to keep that thing clean. And the other thing we did, uh, mechanical, is we actually just used the pool filter. Let me just tell you what you can't do. You can't have 1,200 gallons per minute rushing on filter socks. <laughs> socks do not work in this tank. Um, we tried it, the things just get pummeled. Um, and so that didn't work. We looked at other things like rotary drum filters, and we may come back to that at another, another point in time. We're actually going to start with one of those in the 2500 and see how it goes. So in the meantime, we just went with a pool filter. We stripped out all the metal parts in the, the pool filter. Those are the pleated cartridge, the pleated cartridges that we use in the pool filter. And, and they're changed every three, four days. And it's just on a loop on the sump. Sump rotating. Uh, we've, we've thought about adding mechanical to the display tank itself and not in the sump. But we wanted all the engines and all the water, uh, all the noise down the sub-basement. We didn't want to uh, stop doing engines behind the tank. Yeah, so we run uh, a couple of gram uh, ozonizer, and we run it into one of the skimmers. Um, and that's helped the water quality and, and the water clarity, particularly when you're looking through so many gallons of water. You, you, you could take the same clarity at, at four feet and you, at, at nine feet and, and 16 or 17 feet, and this looks different. So we needed a little bit of ozone. Um, and we're running it in that one skimmer, and that one skimmer outperforms the other skimmer quite a bit because of that ozone. And this is uh, a William Lim uh, UV. It's a 10-bulb system, 375 watts each bulb. So it's about 4,000 watts of, of UV. And uh, this has enough microjoules per square inch, whatever that means. And I'm still trying to figure out what that means, microjoules per square inch to kill ick, velvet, et cetera, really, not just control it. Um, so we've had some crypto outbreaks and so forth. Um, we changed the UV bulbs, and, it, and, it's, and it's just gone. 
um, along with some other things we've been experimenting. And here is, uh, here is Michelle uh, changing the sleeves, uh, just to show you how fragile 10 foot sleeves are, and, and, and we break them all the time. This is such a freak and panic for me time. I hate the UV off. It's, it's a, an anxiety ridden time for me. And um, uh, they make me leave the house. And I like to go away for those weekends and, and they, plan, they plan the UV outage when, when I'm away. Uh, we, we've been changing the bulbs now. We're up to about every six months, the last change. Um, they're spec for a year and a half just being extra cautious after that last ick, ick outbreak. So this is the water chemistry. These are my parameters on, on a snapshot. If you just tested it today, we're testing these things two to three times uh, a week uh, um, on this stuff and, and on many of this stuff like alkalinity and now nitrate, we're testing several times a day. Big part of this nutrient control is this massive sulfur reactor. And, uh, it's a dual chamber sulfur reactor built by MRC. Uh, it, it houses a tremendous amount of sulfur and then it has a separate aragonite chamber. Um, I can tell you the way these things work is you tend to uh, build them up slowly. They take a while, but once they go, this one is ready to gallop. Uh, no matter what we feed it now, uh, it just removes nitrate. So right now it's running at about four gallons per minute through the system, it started at about a half a gallon per minute. And now it's turning over about 25% of the tank a day at zero nitrate, and we are starting to add nitrate now to the tank. So we're dosing uh, a couple thousand mils of nitrate. Um, this is working so well. And we keep looking for the point where it spits out a little nitrate, um, but we can't find it yet. <laughs> Obviously, uh, we do water changes, we backwash. Uh, we use a GFO uh, reactor media, the massive tower, you'll see that. That controls phosphates. We use Roophos. Um, we use 10 five liter buckets of those Roophos bu buckets at a time. And the Roophos uh, cleaning and changing, um, sucking it out, and then rinsing it again. That's a, that usually takes two men half a day just to do that job. Change, change it monthly. Um, and there's some information on the reactors. You'll see them soon. Uh, calcium, alkalinity, how we deal with additives. This is my big calcium reactor. Uh, <laughs> interesting enough, we have never gotten the pH below 7-0 yet. And the reason why that is, is we think the aragonite is melting so much in the sulfur reactor, the sulfuric acid, it has a low pH. So the pH leaving the sulfur reactor has a pH, let's say 6570, uh, it gets buffed up back to 7580 again, but the, the aragonite media melts. And so we have not added calcium once to this tank yet. The only thing we've been adding is about 3000 mils of uh, ESV bionic alkalinity component one, and the rest of these trace elements. And so I just want to go through with you these trace elements because I know I'm going to be asked about them. Uh, we're doing a hybrid moonshining, whatever, what, let's, that's my own term, hybrid moonshining. I believe um, that when science is available with elements, why not make the tank equal to natural seawater? Some of these ICP tests while not 100% reliable, they're reliable enough where we can dose these trace elements. And so we're dosing. A base soup is the Seachem Reef Trace, and we're doing that daily, 160 milliliters. They made uh, that dose up for us, and we, we've been adding and increasing that dose. And then we've been filling in various individual chemicals, um, as the ICP uh, says. Uh, we basically adding somewhere microdosing between uh, five and 60 mLs a day of, of various chemicals. We add some aminos uh, every few days, and that's basically what we do. This is the water change system. Um, this is important. 
And again, we, we have, making water is not a problem. We, we can make, uh, if I use one machine, with, I can make 5,000 gallons of, of high quality RO water a day. 5,000 gallons a day. Uh, I have another machine that, that, that we can do 10,000 gallons have we need it. We're actually going to combine the two machines and, and make one better machine with more RRI, RRDI resin. The planning for this has to be made for these cesspools. Again, you make a 5,000 gallon water change, that means 25,000 gallons is going out at three to four to one of wastewater. And that 25,000 gallons has to go somewhere. So they go straight into our drain, which goes to our cesspool. And the six of those cesspools that we buried, and these are the, these are the, uh, the vat dimensions. This is the big vat, the 5,000 gallon vat. A and one last thing, how do you get these massive vats in the house? Um, we made extensions and when the roof was off. These things were lowered in with cranes. I just want to show you that. Yeah. These are the vats going in into the uh, extension without the roof. That's the big vat, that's the smaller vat, believe it or not. Here's the RODI, the, the uh, industrial machines. Here's the sub-basement. And the point I wanted to be make here is, is what salt we use, how do we do this, and really, we have access to the vats right here from the floor. This is the floor, thing lifts up, uh, the floor is smooth and epoxied and there's no, and getting the, f the floor level is no e easy task either. And um, we have some videos here. But my point really is that we are working with ESV right now on customized salt solutions for us. Uh, he's making us things like low sulfate salt uh, because you have a sulfur reactor, sometimes your sulfate will creep up. He's making us uh, uh, some extra trace elements in our salt and so forth and so on. And it's a Long Island based company, 15 minutes from my house. And I love supporting local businesses. Unfortunately, we can't automate this process. This still needs a human being bake, uh, breaking their back. This is Yeltsin adding salt to the vats. And the way we do this really is we buy dry bulk sodium and dry bulk magnesium sulfate, and then ESV just gives us the liquids. And if the science is really in the liquids. So four bags of sodium chloride, those are 50 pound bags. Uh, one and a quarter bags of magnesium sulfate, 50 pounds. And three of the liquids, that makes a thousand gallons. So I just do that, he just does that four or five times and we, and, and we, we got the right salinity. It's probably a lot easier than um, uh, lugging around a shovel and, and, and huge, uh, what are those called, those massive, what are they called? Super sacks. Super sacks. Yeah, we, we, chose, we chose this route instead of the super sack. Flow. Uh, I sort of showed you the diagram of the flow, but um, what we needed to do was, was because it's a peninsula tank essentially and all three sides are glass or acrylic and viewable, we needed to make the system as fast as possible without uh, internal devices and then be very strategic on internal devices. Uh, so the flow going through the system, these are some of the, the numbers. So these are the horsepowers on the, on the closed loop. They're, these are the, the main pump. Um, and then we have what's called a hydro wizard by Pantaray, which basically doubles the, the flow. And so we think we have, uh, with that Pantaray, which is this huge power head, and we'll show you how that works here. We think we have about 60,000 gallons per hour in flow. And the irony is it's not enough. And we'll be working, and I want to show you what, what we have in store from future, future proofing this tank. But here is where the flow comes from. We wanted to show you this picture. Uh, there's, there's massive returns here in this corner, in this corner, surge valves in the back switched on by the computer, and then, these cl and then the closed loop is all throughout the system. Makes huge waves. This is an ECM 75. 
to zoom in on it. It's a monster pump. Probably gonna get three of these in the tank for additional flow. Any event, the real challenge now is um, we'd like to have some flow hit the reef from the front. There's a ton of flow here coming from this return. I mean, these jets are of tremendous power. Uh, there's a ton of flow here. There's flow coming down the back from these surge valves. If there's a dead spot at all or more future dead spots, we think it's here uh, on the back wall low. And the only way to really get to that, we think, is um, possibly retracting robotic arms that come down from the front do a sweep and then retract back up so you don't see him again. Uh, so we'll be working on that in the next uh, several months. Lighting, uh, that's a nice picture of the lighting. I just wanted to show you there's 13 fixtures. You can hardly see them. The two, the two massive thousand waters are the square ones uh, in the front. Then there's three that angle to the reef here and then there's ones in the back, and then there are a couple of straight downs. 13 fixtures overall. Um, they are max spec commercials. Why, why didn't we go halide? Why did we do LED? Uh, the room up here says it all, okay? Uh, this is not Joe's system where I can stand up there and uh, have coffee and, and, and cake up there. It is not fun up there. And if we had halides, we would be cooking up there on those boards. So that was the main reason. Um, and then some other cool things like how do you do PAR meter tests? Well, you need a, 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 six, a 90 foot cord extension. <laughs> and, and that's pretty interesting when, when we get the PAR meter in there and, and the wires are coming out in different spots. I guess the point I'd like to make about the lighting is we, we've been really uh, moving towards the blue spectrum ourselves. Um, it's not an accident. You go to Worldwide and you go to these, you go to these frag, uh, you know, these farms and they're using mostly blue spectrum. We like to run the blue par, the blue par only at 100 cents on the dollar, 100%. And that blue par only is enough to light the tank in the 200, 250 range. And then I'm adding whites basically for visual appeal. Uh, we'll run them between zero. And some, some fixtures were just running blue, and some were running at 30% white. And the ones we run higher whites are the ones that are further from the tank on the angle. And the closer it gets to the coral and the narrower the lens, the less white I use. And this sort of explains it. This is the lighting page on the computer. And you can see these are the three these are the three lights that are centered on the computer right here. And they have a higher white than the 30s. And everything else is, th these back ones are down to zero, basically, other than above the anemones. I have some white above those, uh, those Magnifica. And um, the coral just seems to do better with, with, with less white and more blue, and, and it's just easier on them. As well as creating an effect in the back, uh, you keep that back blue, it looks like it's going on forever, that background. You light up the back, uh, you, see, you see where the tank ends. So we like that look also. Oh, I guess the, the other point is, we, we got, I got plenty of par to play with. I mean, I, I can turn some of these, I can make this tank seven to 800 par on average throughout the whole tank if we wanted to. It's running on average 300. Uh, 350 and that zip code of which 200, 250 is blue. Makes the videos more difficult though, that I'll tell you. And then the last, uh, the last section here is our hurdles and, and what we've overcome and, and, and what's left. And uh, here's a big picture of my sump. Uh, and then specifically I wanted to show you what we've, what we've got done already and, and what's left. Uh, skimmer upgrade completed, MRC very happy. Sulfur reactor, and we have some pictures of before and after here. So we'll just wait for the pictures. 
Um, these things are basically completed, and um, we rebuild the engines almost annually. Uh, Jonathan, you're basically almost finished now. We, we build the shafts with titanium shafts, take out any kind of brass that was in them and replace it with high quality stainless and changing seals, blah, blah, blah. It is not easy to work with a 10 horsepower pump. We may have a picture of that and with Rashid pick, trying to pick one up, which is not easy. And he's a pretty big guy. Uh, we're going to need to buff this tank out. We finally got the scratches and we're going to need to do an internal and external buff. Uh, we're changing the resin and the RODI. This is, this is what the new resins will be held in, these massive uh, units. Um, coral care. Coral care. We really got this coral care situation starting to, to gel now. And you'll see a separate space now where we do coral care and we transferred, cleaned up the lab. Uh, ozone, I say, is a work in progress. And, and uh, the reason why it's a uh, work in progress is we don't know whether or not, well, let's put it this way. I can't hit my ORP set point anymore. The ozone's on 100%, 100% uh, now, and we don't know if it's the air drying system or the humidity in the room from the dehumidifier not working or the sulfur reactor working so much flow now, it's dumping in a lot of negative ORP in the water. We keep the sulfur reactor uh, negative ORP 3, 400. And so that's dumping in negative ORP. We may need a, uh, more milligrams of ozone for our set point, and we're about to figure that out in the next week or two. Uh, the sump is always a work in progress. We, as we keep adding devices and engines, more and more micro bubbles. Uh, 1,300 gallons a minute, we think, of stuff going through the sump now. We'll show you what that looks like in the jacuzzi. But uh, as it returns back to the main display, that length is so big that a lot of those micro bubbles disappear. It's just some of those micro bubbles show up in some of the auxiliary tanks that are connected to the sump. Um, and so we may have to work with baffles. In the meantime, you'll see our homemade design. And flow, 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 flow. And that will be a robotic arm system probably. And we'll be working with companies like Pantheray and Abyss and trying to figure out the right, uh, the right solution. There you go. There's the coral care process now. This is where we have lights and uh, tools and dipping and and uh, um, you got a guy working in this space all the time now. We're dipping our corals. I'd say we're dipping them every th three days now. Just, what's that? Three times, three times a week, yeah. These are some of the before and after pictures of, of our upgrades. This was the Bermuda skimmer we had before the MRC skimmer. Uh, it worked fine. It worked great, actually. It's just... Uh, there was about 140 gallons per minute through this thing to really work it well. And these two MRCs now do 140 each. So we've doubled our skimming, and I prefer the needle wheel. I think it's more stable foam. This, this Bermuda had uh, uh, an air-injected system. These are the sulfur reactors, the old ones. This is the new one. And this is the micro bubbles in the sump. You, this is a video, right? And how we dam it. We actually make some nice dams out to block the micro bubbles on top at least. Built a big dam here, lots of dams, and more dams. And but you know what? I don't have any more foam really build up in the sump. Yeah, the sump was had so much micro bubbles at one point that we were actually the sump itself was actually a skimmer. So that takes me basically to the summary. And I just wanted to highlight, again, what we're doing here, uh, giving back to the hobby, philanthropy. Um, we just launched this website, polarreef.com. This was launched uh, yesterday, two days ago. Uh, there's limited apparel on here right now because we still want to test the, some of the quality uh, out. But all proceeds and prof all profits of apparel will be going towards charity and philanthropy. Um, I just wanted to help and, and, and 
get kids involved and, and create that spark um, for this hobby. And, and with that, that sort of concludes the presentation. And 15 minutes questions or 10 minutes questions. Here, here's our social media stuff. Um, groups, public page, uh, Instagram, YouTube.